There's been a debate this week uh, that's been raging, and it's, it's not quite the kind of debate you thought. But, uh, in fact, there's this video that's been going on that's been quite popular. Some of you may have even seen it. And uh, t- let me just play it for you and let's unpack it, okay? All right. And the debate is, is this a bear or is that a dude in a suit? All right, that's the video that's been going around, and it's been hotly debated for the past week and a half, right? And, okay, I just want to take a quick poll here. How many of you think that's a bear? Raise your hands. Okay, all right. Oh, good number of you. Somebody, how many of you are like, no, no? That's the dude in the suit. Okay, let me see your hands. Stick it out there. I'm thinking that's a dude in the suit. You know why? That bear has better posture than I do. Have you noticed that? It's like, hey, look at me. You know, like, what is that? What is that? Now, that's the thing, though. There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of doubt. Is it real? Or is it fake? And that's really what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to unpack the reality of there is a question going on that is more consequential than determining if the bear is real or not. The question is, are we as followers of Jesus real or not? Because the reason why that's a more consequential question is because depending on how real we are, it it, it relegates to, it, it, it equates to, it's connected to the impact and the difference that we make in our world. You know, it's astounding. Every year, and I know that the percentage has dropped since the past decade, but still a vast majority of people surveyed, for example, in the Gallup poll, overwhelming majority of people in the United States, number one, they're spiritual, but number two, they believe in God, and still a majority of people say that they, are, they believe in Jesus, right? Now, with so many followers of Jesus... And I don't know about you, but again, many of you probably driven by two or three churches on the way to our church, right? How many of you done that this morning? With so many churches, especially in the South, right? How come we're not making the difference that we're making? I think it goes back to the initial question of, of is it real or is it fake? It really is. See, when you're a follower of Jesus, we're never going to reach perfection this side of heaven. We are perfectly saved if we repent of our sins and trust Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our lives. That's without question. But though none of us reach sinless perfection, we do progress in the way we live our lives in in terms of being different as in Jesus making a difference in the way we live, the way we talk, the way we think, the way we respond. You know, it fleshes itself out. In other words, we stand more like Jesus and not like the bear that you, we used to be. Right? And yet, how come there's not the difference that we see? In Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus told his followers, you are the light of the world. Well, actually, he said, you're the salt of the earth. And next verse, he said, you're the light of the world. But I do want to talk about salt for a minute. Salt. Salt makes a difference in our food, right? And I was just thinking about the amount of salt that we're supposed to be in our country. And the difference that we are or are not making. For example, let's just say, like, um, let's just, for the sake of grins and giggles, let's say in our nation, let's just say 20% of our nation are Christian. How many of you can go with that for right now? Can you go, go with me? Okay. Now, you would think 20% of salt will make a Huge difference. Let me put it this way. Let's say you got 10 pounds of meat and 2 pounds of salt. 10 pounds of ground beef, and you're making burgers. 
if you were add two pounds of salt into that burger, you'd be like, <laughs> right? The salt would be overpowering, wouldn't it? Are you connecting the dots here? If we are to be that salt of the earth, we should, just, just 20%, would make such an overpowering difference in our world. How come we're not? Well, perhaps, maybe we've lost our saltiness. Or, may I say it this way, maybe because a lot of us are fakes. We might know about Jesus, but maybe we're not truly a follower of Jesus. And the reason why this topic is such an important thing for us to address, especially coming out of the, our study in the seven, church of, seven churches of Revelation, is because I know the difference that Jesus wants to make with our church. Because our church, as weird as we are, I mean, look around, really. Look at us. Really, it's okay, look around. <laughs> Somebody's like, really? I mean... Look at the collection of people we have. People from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of styles, all kinds of color, red, yellow. That's me. Black, white. You know? Come from different styles. Some of you like urban. Some of you are rednecks. I'm an orange neck, you know. Yeah, somebody needs to explain to the others that that was kind of funny. Um, you know, it's, look at us. We're all different. But here's the thing that's in common for us. Jesus has made a difference in our lives. And our church, we've gone through so much. And what we have is a unique thing. I don't know if you know. There aren't a lot of churches like us. That we're after the real. We want the real. If it's not real, we don't have time to waste. How about you? I'd rather sleep in on Sundays. <laughs> but if, it, if Jesus is real and if following him makes a real difference, there's not a single thing, a single day that I wouldn't get up for regarding him. And what we need to recognize is that because Jesus wants to make a real difference in us, we can make a real difference in our world. You see, what makes salt so useful isn't that it draws attention to itself, does it? Like, how many of you, like, oh, man, I'm really hungry. You know what I could do? I could really use a bowl of salt. The, the impact of salt is that it loses itself to that which is it is applied. The glory of the salt is that it is given over to the dish. And I am fully convinced that if we at First LG will give ourselves over to Jesus and his great and glorious cause that is so much bigger than ourselves, because Jesus is going to change people's lives, people who are broken, burdened, people who are suffering, people who are spiritually dead, that he's going to bring to life, and we get to be a part of that. And you are meant to live a life so much beyond the life you live. In fact, in Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus mentioned this word for the first time in this instance. He was at a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is not a place where any good Jew would go. Caesarea Philippi is one of those places that are way outside the, you know, where a good Jewish boy would ever venture into because that's like 
Hotlanta. You know, you don't go there. You, you stay in, the, in, in, in small towns, right? And yet Jesus himself led his disciples to Caesarea Philippi in the midst of, quote, a sinful environment. After Peter's declaration of who Jesus is, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, and I tell you that you are Peter. But upon this rock, pointing to himself, I will build my church and the gates of hell can't stop it. This world is dark. It's hellish in many ways. And you are called to be his light bearer. You're called to be his salt. You're called to become an unstoppable force for the glory of Jesus Christ. There's a God who loves you, who's passionate about you, And when you give yourself to him, your life will be forever changed. And you will live a life that is passionate. That's the life we have before us. And that's the movement we got to be. And because of that, we cannot play around. And what cannot be said of us is like, oh, you know those people in First LG? Ah, fake. No. What we must be is we must be real. We must be real in every sense that we can before the Lord. We really, we have to. Because it's just not our purpose and significance at stake. What's at stake is a difference in this world. Because here's one thing that we all can agree on, regardless of where we come from and background we come from. How many of us will agree this world is bad and needs help? Jesus said, I've got an answer. It's you. See, God's purpose in our individual life is often the solution to the problem of this world. And God's purpose for your life is our society's answer to the questions they're asking. It makes a difference. So let's be real. We love to use that term. Let's get that. And today, we're going to get real. In fact, we got to because here's what I ran across that really kind of helped me, the Lord used to kind of help me guide us to this point for our next series. In March 2023's uh, Barna Research, when surveyed, the top reason why people doubt Christianity. Here's what people of no faith said. You know why people of no faith today doubt Christianity? The number one reason they said was Christians. They're supposed to growl, but man, I don't know how they're standing that this doesn't jive. I don't know if you've ever struggled with that in your life. Hey, let's get it right. It's time. Because we don't have long here. I'm staring at the uh, beautiful face of my mother-in-law and recognize how short time is. We don't have long. So let's get after it. It's time to be real. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to start a series called Be Real. And this morning, I tagged his message, Get Real, because we're going to begin a series in the book of James. This is just the introduction. Um, But the book of James is what we're going to spend some time for a while. And the reason why I believe that God has led us here is because the book of James is one of the most practical books of the New Testament. In fact, it's considered the Proverbs of the New Testament. And so when you want to know what it's like, the book of... James really tells us what we're supposed to be about. See, the book of James tells us the difference between what's really a Christ follower and what's really not. And so 
what we're going to do is unpack, go through and spend some time in the book of James. But what we're going to discover, discover is that God's going to teach us things like, hey, you know how you can tell between a real and a fake? We're going to talk about it next week, but how you handle adversity. That tells you right off. Kind of the words that you use. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you have favoritism or not. We're going to cover all those kinds of things. Because it's time to get real. Because I believe that in the days ahead, First LG must be a movement that reaches hundreds of people. And not just here. I'm convinced that we need to reach people throughout this nation. And you're going to be hearing more of that vision in the days ahead. But it's got to start here. It's got to start with us. If we're going to make a difference there, we've got to be different here. You tracking? You with me so far? Or did I press a little hard? Eh, it doesn't matter. I'm going to keep pressing. It's all right. <laughs> it's going to hurt good. I promise if it's going to hurt. It will. It's going to be better. You'll be better. I'll be better for this. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of James. And so if you have your Bible, open you up to book of James, chapter 1, verse 1. Real quick background. James, who's the author? Well, it's not James, one of the apostles, one of the the 12. In fact, James actually is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Half-brother because same mother, not the same father. Because Jesus was, you know, was born of a virgin. And that's significant because Jesus didn't have the sin pass along. He was a sinless from birth, lived a sinless life, so that he could be the sinless sacrifice for our sins. But James is like us. But he grew up as a brother, grew up in the same household of Jesus. Now, I just, can you imagine what that must have been like? I'm a single kid, so I don't really know. How many of you have, have siblings? How many have other brothers? How many of you have ever been compared to your sibling? Can you imagine if Jesus was in your household and he was your sibling? I mean, how many times did the the mom say, Mary say, hey, James, why can't you be more like Jesus? You know? And I can imagine it'd be hard. In fact, Scripture tells us James wasn't really into Jesus. In fact, when Jesus went back to his hometown in Matthew 13, basically, the brothers and sisters, because Jesus had more than just one other earthly sibling, you could, the indication is they didn't believe in him. They didn't trust him. They're like, oh, hey, don't we know them? Don't we know who they are? And so the idea is that uh, James was like the rest of us until Jesus was resurrected. And when Jesus came back from the grave, after he died for the sins of all humanity, it changed James significantly. So much so that James became a devout follower of Jesus. So much so that James calls Jesus his Lord. So much so that James became one of... He, the first leader, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, which is like the mother church of all church, New Testament churches. And he was a pastor there for about 20 years. That's a little bit of background about the author and the human standpoint. But God inspired James to write this book. And like I said, it is action-packed. Because if you're real, it shows. Right? If it's real, it shows right. And so what we're going to do is study those things, but let's just have the introduction for this morning. Because overarchingly, what we're going to discover is that if you're real, you don't try to use Jesus. Instead, if you're real, you try to become useful to Jesus. James chapter 1, verse 1. Let's all stand as we read. 
As we honor his word, this is what the word of God says. James chapter 1, verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. And somebody thinking, Talon, you're actually going to preach a whole message on that verse? Yeah. It's got a lot to say to us. I'm not going to take long, but still. It's important for us to, as we launch into the series of being real, it sets the tone. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, teach us to be real. Help us to know you for real. And as a result, bring about real change in our lives and our families' lives for the world's good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Like I said, it's a practical book. But in the beginning, it sets the tone for us. Because the way James starts out, remember he's the half-brother of Jesus? Did you notice how he introduced himself, though? James, a what? A servant of God. I gotta be honest. If we were James, I think we would be tempted to start out the letter a little bit differently. Wouldn't you? I think we would add a little bit more to the introduction than that. Perhaps we could say something like this James, the one who came from the same womb that Jesus came from. James, the one who pastored the first church of all the churches in the New Testament. You know, you know the history of Christianity. That's me, James. In fact, many biblical scholars consider James the first book written, first letter written in the New Testament in terms of chronology. I would tout that too. The first one to ever write in the New Testament. You know? But that's not what James does. Because he was real. See, being fake is all about the show, right? It's all about the show. It's about outward appearances, right? But being real is more concerned about actually operating differently. Actually operating differently. I I came across uh, this guy was telling me about his his affinity to this watch. And I got a picture of this watch. In fact, let's put it up. It's coming up, the watch. There it is. How many of you have seen one of these watches? He's like, oh, one day I want one of these watches. They're so cool. They're so nice. If you can't read it from here, from where you're sitting, it's a Breitling. And uh, that particular watch costs $9,300. I mean, it is supposed to be an exclusive. Is it piece of artistry at work? And nine thousand three hundred dollars to tell time. <laughs> hey, if you got one, that's great, you know. Uh, but this guy was saying, "Oh, I want one really, really bad." Well, one of his friends, you know, who's a longtime friend, knew about his affinity to the watch. One day, showed up to him uh, and he, with a box, and he opened this box, and it was his. It was a watch. And he flipped out. Oh, I can't believe he did this. Oh, it's so good. So good. I mean, he just still carried on so much to the point where his friends said, whoa, 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 whoa. It is a gift, but I didn't pay that much. You mean you didn't? No, it's 50 bucks in Chinatown. <laughs> Why? Because that, he... The, It was a brightling looking watch, but it was a knockoff, right? It's a fake, but here's the thing. Have you noticed those fakes lately? If you were to get one of those fakes, they've designed to have the same weight as the original. The same type of logo, same type of appearance. I mean, to the outward eye, if you were to just glance at it, it is the watch. Except if you were to open it up. 
the machinery, the operation is not the same. It still tells time. But it doesn't have the 21 jewels of precision and all the things that went with the Swiss movements of that clock, that, that watch. And here's the thing. Like I said earlier, if you, at a first glance, between a real and a fake, they look alike. But real operates differently. And we as followers of Jesus, we must operate differently than the rest of those who don't know Jesus. Because he's made a difference in our lives. And for us, who desire to be real, it's not about just using Jesus. It's about being useful to Jesus. We need Jesus. That's why, in a sense, we kind of use him. But for us, the, the mindset shifts to being, is my life useful to him? Now, before I go too far, I do need to make a point of the fact that James, man, nobody knew Jesus better than James. Have you ever thought about it that way? I mean, James knows about stuff that Jesus, about Jesus that you and I just can't know. Because there's a whole lot of Jesus' life that we don't read in the scripture. For example, from the time that he was born to the time that he was 12, we don't know a lot of that, what that happened, right? From the time he was 12 to the time he was 30. We don't know a lot. I mean, we hardly know anything about that period of Jesus' life. But James does. Everything Jesus encountered, James probably saw. Every meal that Jesus ate, James probably was there. Every prayer that Jesus may have prayed openly, James probably heard. James knew everything there was to know about Jesus. But here's what we have also learned from James. Knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus aren't the same thing. See, and that's where some of you may be fitting in this morning. I mean, you know a lot about Jesus. I mean, you may be able to quote verses. You may be able to, like, rattle off the Bible stories. But there has to be a time in your life well, you come to a point and say, Jesus, it's not enough that I know about you. But I really want to know you. And that happens through repentance of sin. It happens. But when you say, you know what? I've got a problem. I have an issue. And I'm not right with God. Not really. James wasn't right with God. James was his own half-brother. But he had to come to a point where he said, you know what? Because it's not enough that that you believe that Jesus is God. It's got to be a point where you say, Jesus is my God. See, according to Greek scholars... That James chapter 1, verse 1, when it reads, James, the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You can grammatically translate it this way. Jesus Christ, who is God and Lord. In other words, from the very beginning, the half-brother of Jesus outright declares the deity of Jesus Christ. Saying, that's mine. You can believe that Jesus is God all day long. But until you get to a point where he becomes your God, your Lord, your Savior, you don't have a real relationship with him. Scripture tells us demons believe in Jesus and they shudder. And they can quote verses better than we can. But they don't have a personal faith relationship with him. So the question is, have you, come, have you been using Jesus? You know, Jesus, I want to throw a prayer out there for you. I, just, I need help with the job. I need help with this relationship. I need, and there's nothing wrong with that. He loves you. He wants to take care of that. So I'm not downplaying that. But sometimes we just approach 
Jesus in kind of a transactional way. I know this, and so I'm kind of saying this, and it's almost like a magical spell. There's got to be a point where you say, Jesus, you're mine, and I am yours. Here I am. I repent of who I've been. I repent from where the way my life is going. I'm going to turn around and go to you. I'm all yours. And we see that in the way he goes on to describe himself, not just how he describes Jesus. Remember he said, you, we could just translate that verse, Jesus Christ who is God and Lord, but also notice the words, James, a servant. There are two words that are translated into English, servant, in the New Testament. The first word is diakonos, which means to serve. For example, that's where we get our words in the title deacon. So we have deacons in our church, and you know what they do? They beautifully serve. They beautifully serve. But there's a second Greek word that is also translated in the New Testament as servant, and it's the word doulos, but it's better translated as Bond servant. Bond servant. What's the difference? Well, the difference can actually be described, and the Bible tells us the difference. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 21, we see a difference because, you see, there was supposed to be in every seven years a year of jubilee that would, if you were even a slave, that you would be set free at the end of seven years. And so if you were a slave, quote, a diakonos, a servant, you could be set free, but you became a bondservant when you, as a slave, as a servant, says, you know, my master is so good. I love him so much, and he loves me so much. I willingly choose to be his slave. And that's the difference between a servant and a bondservant. A bondservant was set free, but chooses to to remain in servitude. And that's what James is saying here. He said, I am a, not just a servant, I'm a bondservant. In fact, this is how a bondservant becomes a bondservant officially in the Hebrew culture. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 5 and 6 tells us this. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges, which is kind of like an official court recording, recording of this. A situation, and he shall take him to the door or the doorpost of the residence of the master's house. And get this, and pierce his ear with an awl. One of the ears, just one ear, it doesn't have to be both. Then he will be a servant for life. Can you imagine? You lean against the doorpost, you got your earlobe going. And I'm not talking about it's not one of those, you know, like earring punches that our ladies get often. You know, the little bit of time, you know. I understand they're painful too, but this is an awl. You know what an awl is? Awl is a metal poker. <laughs> and I'm thinking those things, and some, some scholars say, those things can be as wide as the width of your pinky nail. So it's like getting a gauge instantly in your ear, right? And some are thinking, ooh, that's kind of brutal, wasn't it? Even this points to the one that we love and the one that loves us so much because Jesus is the ultimate bondservant to you and me. See, Jesus is God Almighty. But he said, Father, I willingly choose to lay down my life and serve. That's why Jesus says, I didn't come here to be served but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. To give my life for you, for me. And so Jesus had a piercing too. See, a bondservant gets pierced in the ear. Jesus was pierced in his hands. Jesus was pierced in his feet. And not by an awe about a Roman spike. And eventually his body was pierced in the side. Because 
ultimately, when it comes to being real, it means to recognize Jesus for all he is. And that has to be a point in our lives where we say, Jesus, because you did that for me, for my sin, for my salvation, for my life, for my eternity. When my mother dies, I'm going to see her again. This life is the end. And we need to quit living for just this life. And Jesus said, I've got that for you. Because I chose to be a bondservant for you. And you know what reels ultimately decide? Reels ultimately decide. I'm not just going to benefit from Jesus. I am going to be useful to him. Like I said, we're going to unpack more of what that means practically in terms of how we handle everyday life. We're going to talk about the difference between fake and real in the days to come. But I just want to begin this opening series here with that reality, with that truth. But some of you here today you need to come to a bondservant moment. You need to come to a point where you say, you know what? It's about time I lay my life down for the one who laid his down. If you want to be real, that's what it takes. Otherwise, you're always going to hold things back. And that duplicitousness that we're going to talk about in the book of James will cause your mind to be doubled. And you will find yourself acting like that thing that we saw in the video. Is it a man? Is it a bear? Or is it just an oddity? No. It's time. I'm going to ask our worship team to come and lead us into this time of response. And as they come, here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. After we pray, we're going to stand. And I'm just going to simply ask you, just to be raw before Jesus. And the question that I'd like for you to ask him is this. Lord Jesus, have I given everything to you? Like you've given everything to me. Because the only way to experience the real life that Jesus provides begins there. And But once you're there, whoa. Once you're there, whoo. Your life transforms. And your life becomes significant. I didn't say popular. I didn't say famous. But I did say significant and meaningful. And your life will be used of God to make a difference for all eternity in the lives of others. Because you will be the answer to this world's problem. Because Jesus is the answer in and through you. But it begins there. It begins there.